Hello, and welcome to another episode of Professional Book Girl. My name is Kayla, and I read a ton of books, so I can recommend the best to you. And I am coming to you live from New York City, where I have just survived my first earthquake. I am literally shook. Um, The earthquake happened this morning. It is now after work on this lovely Friday night um, in the past for you because this is a time travel show. And I was literally shaken out of my bed because I, on Fridays, I, so I work remotely and on Fridays, I let myself work in bed for like a long time. And this was early in the day though. It was like 10 a.m. or something. And all of a sudden, like my bed was shaking so much. And then I realized that every like I, everything on my walls was rattling too. And my third thought was an earthquake. The first, actually maybe the fourth, the first thought I had is like the people that live above me are very loud. And the building that I'm in is like over a hundred years old and definitely not the most structurally sound, especially for an earthquake of all things. But at first I was like, did they drop something so heavily that like my room is shaking? And then I was like, oh my God, it's finally happening. The building is collapsing. And then I was like, oh, maybe it's a terrorist attack. And then I was like, surely this is not an earthquake. But I was like, it had to have been. So I did what everybody does. And I immediately opened up Twitter and people were saying, oh my God, an earthquake in New York. And then my roommate was like, oh my God, I felt it too. And I survived. This is actually, you know, people listening in California are probably like, you're so dramatic, whatever. But like, this does not happen here to the point where it was my fourth thought. Like, I fully thought that we were having another terrorist attack in New York City before I thought it was an earthquake. But when I was in high school, it was the summer before my senior year of high school. So it was like 13 years ago. There was an earthquake. Um, I don't think it was as high as this one just was, but I had slept over at my best friend's house the night before and we woke up because her family was freaking out and we ran downstairs and we were like, what is going on? And they were all like, did you not feel that earthquake? And we literally slept through it and we were like so pissed that we didn't feel it. So obviously I was in bed for the second earthquake, but this time I felt it and I was just like out on a walk and I heard these like little kids talking about it on the street. It was really funny. It's obviously... I'm talking about it to you. Like it's at all any of us in New York are talking about. It It was just a wild, what a way to start the day in a little earthquake. Um, But I hope everyone is fine in New Jersey. I haven't heard anything like bad happen, but whoa, so freaky, especially since I just read The Phoenix Crown, which is about the giant San Francisco earthquake in like 1906 or something. So I was like, oh, oh, great. I know exactly how this can go. But I I survived. I am here to tell the tale and talk to you about books. But before we do that, very quickly, actually, this is about books. Um, Our book club pick for April is Right on Cue by Fallon Ballard. We will be having that book club episode air on May 2nd. If you would like to be included in the episode, please submit your thoughts to me either by email at professionalbookgirlpod at gmail.com. You can record a voice memo or type your thoughts out or DM them to me at caredwhat or at professionalbookgirl. Please have them to me by April 30th. I'm really excited to read this romance. I'm just a huge fan of Alan Ballard. So it's going to be really fun. And if you are new here and you don't know how the book club works, basically you just read it on your own time. And then the episode will be out on May 2nd. And it's great because whenever you finish the book, the episode will be there for you. So if you are a little behind on your reading, I know, I think I said this last week too, but some of you have been saying that you're behind, but it's fine because now you don't have to wait for the episode. It is there. And ready for you. So it is time to talk about what I am obsessed with. And honestly, the broader thing that I'm obsessed with this week is all the historical shows that have been coming out on Apple TV. I promise you I'm done talking about Masters of the Air. I'm just mentioning it because that was the one that started this all off. And then I watched the new look. I finished it yesterday. So that is what this is going to be about. But then last night I started Manhunt, which I am obsessed with. It is so good. It is about the manhunt that happened after John Wilkes Booth shot Abraham Lincoln. So I know we have a lot of international friends who listen. If you're not aware, five days after the Civil War ended, Abraham Lincoln was at the Ford's Theater, which I have been there. And you, it's so weird now because it's like next to Azara and we like went shopping and then toured the Ford Theater. It was very bizarre, but he was there and John Wilkes Booth, who was this famous stage actor at the time, I guess stage actors were the only actors there were in the 1860s, um, shot Lincoln and then like jumped on the stage and like 
he said like for the south and he made it like very known it was him who did it he was very proud of it um and he escaped and just like technology and everything like they weren't able to catch him right away so this show is about it basically follows the secretary of war as he is trying to catch john wilkes booth and you're following booth as he's escaping anthony boyle plays him who was in masters of the air and he is just having a moment he is so talented he's doing like his character as Booth is so different from when he played Crosby in Masters of the Air, but he is such a great actor. It's like really cool to see him having a moment right now um, and excited to see what he does next. But uh, it it is really interesting because I never knew about like this manhunt. I did read the book Booth that came out like two years ago, which is about the Booth family because he was from like a family of actors and like the assassination is in that book a little bit, but it's really interesting. And I, really am learning like a lot about the civil war while i'm watching it um and like really realizing how much further like lincoln had so much more in mind with restoration and i feel like we would have been a lot further ahead with like progress in this country if he wasn't assassinated so it's all really interesting there's five episodes out right now i watched the first three last night because i wasn't feeling well so i was just like in bed watching it i couldn't stop i'm gonna watch the next two this weekend there's gonna be seven episodes in total i'm really really enjoying it but i told you guys last week what i was gonna be talking about this week and it is the show the new look which is on apple tv so many people have messaged me asking if I'm watching this show and I totally understand why everyone was asking me. I waited a bit because I wanted a bunch of episodes to be out, which I'm really glad I did because the first time I sat to watch it, I binged like five episodes in one go and then I watched it weekly from that point. So I knew the show was coming out and I the, the way that I – okay, here's the thing with Apple TV though. Like I'm a huge fan of their shows, but beyond the morning show, I feel like they don't really do much promotion for their shows. I saw a tweet that was like, Apple TV has to be someone's just like passion project and they're just making the shows that they want, which makes so much sense. Like, especially with all these historical shows, there's also a show coming out about Benjamin Franklin, which I'm obviously going to be watching. Um, And like, I heard about the new look because of the music. So Jack Antonoff produced the album and it's all original music that was made for the show it was basically like um a song per episode and the episode would play in the credits um so like the 1975 did a song for it which they're my favorite band florence and the machine i love florence like uh my friend emily the lazy library dm me and was like what spell did you cast to get this to happen like two of my favorite artists creating songs for this show about something that i am obsessed with so that's how i heard about it from the music and then uh, so many people started DMing me, asking me about it. So on like on paper, this is a show about Christian Dior and the new look. So if you – I'm trying to figure out the best way to explain this. So I'm obsessed with history as we all know and I'm also really obsessed with fashion history and this all ties so closely into World War II history, which World War II does play a big role in the beginning of this show. Um, and you, it's really interesting. They show you like what all the designers were doing at this time. But uh, so when Christian Dior had his house's first show in 1947, he literally changed fashion and culture and history with that show. It was everyone was still very depressed from the war. Fashion changed during the war because of rationing. And now all of a sudden you were able to have these like voluminous silhouettes again because fabric wasn't being rationed. And he literally changed fashion and the way that fashion shows happen and it is such a that show that like this whole episode this whole one it's a one season show this whole show builds up to the finale moment of his first show and that is a pivotal historical historic moment in history really but especially in fashion so i assume that it was just going to be about like that moment in time but this is really a show about christian dior and coco chanel and like the events that they both lived through in World War II and then the aftermath of that. So I'd say the first half of the season really is about what was happening with them during the war. And then the second half is the aftermath. So it's interesting because like it's called the new look, which is Dior, but Chanel was just as much of a character. Like half of the screen time went to 
Coco Chanel, which I really like to see the juxtaposition. I really wish Scaparelli was a heavier part of the show. Like she's mentioned just at one point, I read the last collection I've talked about on this podcast before, but that is about the rivalry between um, Coco Chanel and Elsa Scaparelli, which is so interesting and also like very political and plays into World War II. But to kind of like place all of this in history during before World War II and still to this day, Paris was like the epicenter of fashion and they're like the home of couture. And when the Nazis took over France, they were like the top Nazi officers wanted these designers to make fashion for them. And it, they had to decide if they were going to open, stay open or close. So Scaparelli closed, Chanel closed. Um, in this show, we meet a young Balmain, who at this time didn't have his own house yet, but we made a young Balenciaga. I think he stayed open. And Christian Dior at the time was working for Lucy and Lelong. And Lelong is someone that I only ever really learned about through my historical fiction books because he is one of, he was like the fashion house at the time. And he stayed open, which was like very, you know, like morally corrupt, I guess, because he was making clothes and fashion for the enemy. But his ration was like, I need to keep he had hundreds of people working for him he's like i want them to still have jobs so christian Dior was a designer for lucien long at the time and long is a huge character in the show and he was a huge influence on christian Dior's life and career um and so during the war dior was on the side of the allies very clearly his sister catherine dior was actually in the french resistance and i was so so happy that catherine is a huge part of the show i learned about her i think she was mentioned in in a natasha lester book and then she's popped up in a few other historical fiction novels there's a nonfiction book about her miss dior which i read after i bought it when i was in paris actually i read it after that um she was just so remarkable. Um, she, like I said, she was a member of the French resistance. She was captured. She went to Ravensbrook. She was a huge inspiration to Dior. The perfume Miss Dior is named after her. And she's kind of, I felt like she was kind of lost to the pages of history, but I was so happy. She was a huge part of the show. Maisie Williams played her. Um, but then Coco, let's talk about, let's talk about Chanel. She closed during the war, but She was literally in bed with the Nazi. She was having an affair with a Nazi. And it's so interesting the way that this is like always talked about because it's always like alleged that she was a Nazi spy, but there is like documentation and paperwork that she was like agent Westminster. And I realized after the show came out that like not a lot of people knew that about Chanel. Um, I'm not going to, I don't want to like say, I don't want to spoil the show, obviously. So I'm not going to like I feel like you may be listening and thinking like, oh, I'm telling you everything, but so much happens. Like I am just telling you like the big overview of it really, but it was really interesting to see her juxtaposed with Christian who obviously like his sister is in the resistance. So just doing completely different things during the war. Um, And Coco is just like such an interesting character. She can come off like very arrogant and um, but at the same time, you have to keep in mind that she was a woman in business at this time, which in any time is not an easy thing to do in this industry dominated by men. And she is arguably the most famous one to this day. So um, it was interesting to see that it was so much about her, but it wasn't really marketed like that. Like that was really interesting to me. So I did enjoy the show. I really loved actually seeing the fashion. I thought that it was beautifully shot, like just so well done. Um, the person who played Coco specifically, like she did such a great job. All of her outfits were so great. Like it was just so spot on. The only thing for me was like, I was a little bored at times because I already knew all of this. Like there was nothing in this show that was new to me information just because this is like my thing, you know? So I liked seeing it brought to life. I like that people are um, learning this story. I'm so happy that Catherine Dior is becoming like a bit more mainstream now that Maisie Williams played her. Um, People learning the truth about Chanel. She will just always be such an interesting figure in history to me. Like talk about a complicated person, um, but also so talented. And yeah, I did. I did really like it. The last thing I wanted to say is the only thing I caught on that wasn't real was that in the show, Coco has his friend Elsa. And I was like, who is this woman? Because I've like, I've read nonfiction books about Chanel as well. So like, I've like studied her life and I'm like, I've never heard of this person. But so I researched it and they kind of like combine two different people 
to create the character of Elsa, which was a little interesting to me just because everything else was so true to life. And I guess when you when you're thinking about her with her dealings with the Nazis, like it's not alleged because there's like proof, but there's also like this is like a fictional take on it, I guess. Like we don't actually know what happened, but I think that the way they portrayed it was it seemed very true to life and something that you can like imagine happening. And I don't want to spoil it. That's all I'm going to say. But on that note, I do have book recommendations. If you watch The New Look and you want more about Dior or Chanel historical fiction. So the first one is Sisters of the Resistance. This is when the Catherine Dior plays a part in. Uh, then I would say all of Natasha Lester's books, all of them have a historical aspect. All of them deal with the House of Dior in some way, specifically The Three Lies of Alex St. Pierre. She's working as a publicist for that first famous show. And it was really funny. I was actually thinking of the character Alex St. Pierre during this because um, it was this huge thing that like Carmel Snow, who is the editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar at the time, was like coming over to see the post-war collections and she wanted to like name like a new reigning head in Par- uh, no, Parisian-, Parisian couture. And like that's a part of the book, Three Lives of Alex St. Pierre. So all the Natasha Lester, I've learned so much about Dior history through her. Then there's a book, The Chanel Sisters, which is about Chanel and her one sister um, who had a very interesting life and actually worked as a seamstress in the beginning of the Chanel days. The book, The Last Collection, which I mentioned is about Coco Chanel and Elsa Scaparelli. And then the book, The Paris Model, which is about um, a model who comes over to Paris and she becomes a model or a mannequin, as they were called back then, for Dior. So um, we're going to continue talking about books and we're going to continue talking about fashion, actually, because I have three historical fiction books for you today. You guys know I I just love history and I love books about history and I love talking to you about books about history. So that is what we're doing on this episode. The first one is my favorite book of 2024 so far. It is The Disappearance of Astrid Picard by Natasha Lester. So this was what I'm saying, my first five-star read of the year. The first actual five-star read was The Palace Papers by Tina Brown, but it was a nonfiction book I did on audio. And it's just like, it counts, but it like doesn't count. So like, this is the first five-star book of the year. And I got what is better than the five-star feeling. I am like immediately reading this book was like, oh, this was written for me. This book has everything that I love. It is about fashion, music, it's like it girls in society, New York, Paris, strong women, family dramas. There's a mystery element, the historical element. Like I I loved it so much. I did not want it to end, but I also was like, so the book is called The Disappearance of Asher Picard. So you can get the hint that there's a disappearance. I wanted to know what happened to Asher so badly. Like I couldn't figure it out, but I was like, I don't want it to end. Like I just loved this so, so much. I knew I was going to love it when I heard about it. I have loved all of Natasha Lester's books. She is one of my favorites, but this one just, it was just different. And I know that. So, I hope everyone listening understands this feeling that when you're reading this book and you're like, oh my God, it's like somebody knew what I wanted in a book and wrote it for me. And that is what I got when I was reading this book. So I'm very excited to chat to you about today. It is going to be a little bit hard though without spoiling because there's just like throughout the book, all of these twists and turns happening. And I don't want to give any of it away because I really enjoyed being surprised by things. So it might be a little bare bones. Um, I'm going to do my best, but I love this book so fucking much. Okay, so our maid girl, as you can guess, is Astrid Ricard, and we meet her as she is a fashion student at Parsons School of Design in New York City in the 1970s, and she is she was raised on Long Island, but we know right away that she was adopted and that her birth mom is Ms. Ricard, who is this famous muse for, you guessed it, Christian Dior. So this is really the Dior episode of Professional Book Girl. If they would like to sponsor, I would not say no because the Dior lady bag is one of my dream bags. My other dream bag is a Chanel boy bag. So uh, one day I will own both of them. Uh, anyway, so we meet her as she's living in New York City. You know, she's really kind of like trying to get on her feet. She's a student, so she's pretty broke. She's uh, making friends and she, like I said, is in fashion school. So 
one day she is in class and this guy hawk jones comes in and hawk is an up-and-coming fashion designer he's also really hot and he is kind of like showing the class how to put together a garment and he has this bolt of silver lame fabric and the way he starts draping it on the mannequin astrid is like no like this is how it should be and she goes up to the front of the room and basically constructs she makes the dress but the way of the world hawk gets the credit for it so they start selling the dress in because he has a store they start selling it in his store. Um, she is being photographed in it all the time. And everyone is saying like Astrid is Hawk's muse. But actually she is an extremely talented fashion designer. Hawk falls in love with Astrid, like literally love at first sight. And they kind of have this like very passionate love affair. Like it was really exciting to read. Um, and it's at a time when like one of their friends gets drafted to Vietnam and you can just everything felt so high stakes and you get that sense in their love for each other but also like they're trying to run these businesses and make names for themselves and Hawk store very quickly becomes like the place to be in New York City Astrid kind of sets it up as like there's a giant work table where you can see women working you can see Astrid is sitting there designing things her designs are being sold in the store but you can guess hawk is getting credit for a lot of them and she becomes just like this it girl and one night they're out at a club and she's wearing the silver dress and she's photographed in it and it makes the cover of time magazine and that is it they she is like society's number one girl like imagine in 1970s paris hilton and then her and hawk are like all anyone is talking about i'm watching gossip girl and it reminded me a little bit of Gossip Girl in the way that like people would come into the store to see them because they knew they would be at Hawk's store. So she, Astrid is like, also reminded me a little bit of Daisy Jones. It is of the same era, but when in Daisy Jones, when she says, I'm not the muse, like that is a very big part of this. She always was like, I don't want to be like my birth mom, Mizza. I am not a muse. Like I am the designer. I am the creator. And she is so talented. Um, And her, like the book is, three timelines i'm not going to tell you what all three are i'm going to only going to tell you two of them but they both go um asher's timeline starts from like the beginning of the book from when her and hawk meet through to the battle of versailles so this was a real event that happened in the 1970s because versailles which I freaking love Versailles, one of my favorite places on earth. Um, it was in disrepair. Like it was not it. Like the French government, I guess, like left it to kind of like fall apart, which is so devastating, obviously. And the fashion community decided to host this fundraiser to restore Versailles. And it was a battle, like a fashion show battle between American designers and French designers. I have never heard about this until I watched the show. Halston on Netflix, which is a Ryan Murphy show. I highly recommend if you're into fashion history or even just the 70s. It's a really great show. Um, and it was just this insane show. Like Liza Minnelli performed for the Americans. And like I you almost like can't believe that it actually happened, but it did. And Asher's whole timeline is leading up to this night of the Battle of Versailles when she disappeared and was never seen from again. The dress that she was wearing was found with blood on it and that was it. And it kind of just became this legend of like what happened to Astrid Picard, like who killed her. Um, it like a movie was made about it in the 80s. Like it was just like her name, like she was always was famous then after she probably always would have been famous, but she became like infamous. That's the word I'm looking for after this disappearance. But I said there's a second timeline. So in It's Not the Current Day, I think it was 2012, uh, we are with Blythe, who is the daughter of Astrid and Hawk. Like, I'm obsessed already because I also – I don't know if you guys know this, but like, I guess I'm kind of obsessed with the – I'm not obsessed with Nepo babies. I'm obsessed with the idea of being a Nepo baby, probably because I wish I was a Nepo baby. Like, if I wanted to be a teacher, I would be a Nepo baby in my town that I'm from because my family is like – locally famous um but i i'm not i wish i was nebo baby and i love the fact that like now we are we follow we're following astrid and hawk's like insane love affair and then we're also learning about 
their daughter. So we meet the daughter as she, I think she's in her 40s. She is going through a divorce. She has two young kids and she grew up like pretty estranged from, obviously Astrid wasn't in her life, but um, she was pretty estranged from Hawk. She knew him, but she was raised by her grandmother. She just does not like having her parents' names attached to her. She has also had a career or tried to have a career in fashion, but Astrid and Mizza kind of always like overshadowed her and she just didn't want that and she really has struggled with that her whole life this is a very like little little thing that I don't know if Natasha Lester even realized she was doing but I mentioned in the beginning of this that Astrid went to Parsons and Blythe went to FIT the Fashion Institute of Technology which is where I went to college so I love seeing someone go to my school (laughs) in a book it was very exciting but there is like like FIT's main rival is Parsons and sorry to anyone listening who went to Parsons but at FIT we always say that Parsons is where you go where when you don't get into um FIT for now their design program has become like a big thing but like FIT is just like it's FIT you know so there's there's always like a ranking of the top fashion schools in the world and it's like always a big deal when FIT beats Parsons and It was just the fact that Blythe wanted to distance herself from Astrid so much and she didn't want to be like her that she went to FIT over Parsons. She didn't – like Natasha Lesser didn't make the characters go to the same school. I was like – so did she realize what she was doing there? Because to me, I was like laughing when I read that because I was like that is what someone who if they wanted a career in fashion but wanted to distance themselves from their parent would do. They would go to the parent's rival school. So I just like – really likes that and I think it gives you an idea of like how Blythe was trying to fashion fashion is her passion uh, I hate that phrase when I worked in fashion we would always say it jokingly but fashion is her passion uh, but she's following it even though it's what her mom did but she's still distancing herself from her mom when she can so in Blythe's perspective we meet her as she is going to Paris with her ex's entire family for her ex-mother-in-law's 80th birthday and she acts it like she would come and be there with the kids and the whole nine so she's going through a lot with her ex-husband who's there i actually found all of it really interesting um and while she is there though she is given this offer to potentially revive mizza which mizza is also like astrid's mom but then when astrid started her line it was called mizza so Blythe is given the opportunity to revive her mom Astrid's line. And from there, she kind of starts looking into for the first time in her life what actually happened to her mom. And she starts like seeing her from a different light. And it all kicks off from there. So much happens. Like it it is so good. It's so good. I want this to be a show so badly because even just the fashion and the music, like Mick Jagger makes appearances in the book. Like, just imagine, like, Studio 54 would be so fun. Like, see Astrid and Hawk. Like, ugh, it was just, I loved it so, so much. I can't remember the last time, like, I felt like this when I read a book. I just, like, had fun reading it. It was so good. And, like, the whole disappearance, like, you become so attached to Astrid as you're, like, reading her perspective about everything. And then you – it is a little frustrating when you're reading what Blythe thinks about her mom because you, like, knew Astrid as a person. But um, it's, like, whatever. That's her life, I guess. But it's – it's just so good. But with the disappearance, I was like, what happened? Like, where did she go? Like, who killed her? Like, I couldn't figure it out. It was so, so good. So well done. I said this before, but I'm I'm such a huge fan of Natasha Lester's. Like, all of her books have been huge winners for me. They are all really great historical fiction with a fashion element that you don't have to be obsessed with fashion to love it. It's just like a fun treat. And it makes them all so different from other – it makes her so different from other historical fiction authors um and also this book like i don't think there's a recommended reading order for her books but this one specifically oh that's so funny i just got a notification from apple tv that there's a new episode of manhunt for me to watch tonight um but this book has appearances from other characters specifically alex st pierre who i mentioned about when i was talking about the dior show she's in this book a lot in a way that if you have not read the three lives of alex st pierre Things in that book will be spoiled for you in this one. So I would say if you think you're going to go down the whole Natasha Lester rabbit hole, which I highly recommend. I wish I could read them all for the first time again. Um, I would just do Alex St. Pierre before you read this one. But otherwise, like 
free to go. Love them all so much. This one has made its way onto my favorite shelf. The first Natasha Lester book on my favorite shelf. The first book to make is my favorite shelf in a long time. I loved it. I obviously gave it five stars. That is The Disappearance of Astrid Picard by Natasha Lester. The next book is another historical fiction, obviously. It is American Daughters by Piper Hewley. And I just realized I didn't write down what day this comes out. So you're going to listen to me live Google. This comes out on, oh, it's out. Never mind. <laughs> this book is out now. I had an early copy because actually the second I finish recording this episode, I'm going to be interviewing Piper about this book. So keep your eyes and ears open because on Thursday, you'll get to hear me chat with Piper about this book. And I will be talking to her about her last book by her own design, which is about Anne Lowe, one of my, it's one of my favorite books. I've spoken about it many times on this podcast. Um, I am so excited to chat with Piper because I, I'm just a huge, huge fan of hers. So American Daughters is her latest book that is out now. And this is a biographical fiction about Alice Roosevelt and Portia Washington. So speaking of Nepo babies, uh, these two, I wouldn't, I, I guess I shouldn't say that they're Nepo babies, I guess, but I guess they are. They just have very influential fathers. So Alice Roosevelt is the daughter of Teddy Roosevelt. There is a book just solely about her called American Princess, which I highly recommend. She was kind of like Washington, like DC is like bad girl <laughs> of her time. Like she was pushing the boundaries. She was so rebellious. She just seemed like such a fun time. Um, I think I've said this on this podcast before when talking about her. I can't keep track of when and where I say things. So if I'm ever repetitive, Sorry. Um, I'm also operating under the assumption that everyone doesn't remember every single word that I say. But she, like, if she was around today, like, we would be, like, following her antics on, like, Dumois and being like, oh, my God, what is she getting up to right now? Like, the Biden granddaughters are just way too chill compared to what Alice Roosevelt was. But speaking of that, like, Naomi Biden's wedding, I, I that will forever be my wedding inspo, which I'm not planning on getting married. But if I did her wedding and Kate Middleton. That's my wedding inspo in case you in case you guys wanted to know. Um anyway though, speaking of weddings in the White House, Alice Roosevelt is Teddy Roosevelt's daughter, just remarkable badass woman of any time, but specifically her time. She just seemed like such a character. She was so involved in politics. She freaking hated her Roosevelt cousins, FDR and Eleanor. Um she remained like a staunch Republican throughout her lifetime, which, um, cause her, that was her dad's party. And then her dad formed his own party and she briefly moved over to that party and yada, yada, yada. I actually like reading her life was reminded a lot of like Teddy Roosevelt's presidency. And he, he was just a wild guy, but the other protagonist in this book is Portia Washington, who was a new to me historical figure. She was the daughter of Booker T Washington, who that name is I'm assuming familiar to most of you listening. He was a former slave who founded the Tuskegee School in, I think it's in Alabama. And actually, if you watched the last season of The Gilded Age, the, I forgot, I, you know, I can't remember names, but the character that's a reporter, sh her and the hot newspaper guy go to Tuskegee and they meet Booker T. Washington and his wife and they stayed with them. So it was really interesting to read it right after, I mean, I watched that in December, but um, I a lot of this book takes place at the school and the school is a huge part of it. And I really, really enjoyed learning more about that. But it was cool because I was able to picture it because they, I, we literally just saw it in the Gilded Age. Like I was picturing the actor who played Booker T. Washington in the Gilded Age. Portia wasn't mentioned in that though, which I'm a little disappointed because she was such an amazing, remarkable woman. She was ex an extremely talented musician. She goes off to Europe for a bit to study, which that part was so interesting because race relations come to play in the book, obviously, but um, reading about her experiences with racism in America versus Europe, and there's this moment where it's like, why do I even go back to America? And it was just very interesting to read about, but the book opens up with Alice and Portia meeting because they were unlikely friends for this time. And the reason why they first met is because when Teddy was president, he took a meeting with Booker T. Washington. And to him, it was like an obvious thing to do. But 
he like they say in the book that he didn't realize it would cause like this scandal and drama in the news and in society which um i feel like maybe was a little naive of him knowing what we know about america but people were not happy that the president sat down with this black man and they ended up forming this friendship and their daughters meet at an event that they're both at and they become friends and it was just very interesting you we only meet them together and a few times throughout the book because they live in different parts of the country. Like I mentioned at one point, Portia is in Europe and, but their lives mirrored each other so much, but then they were also just so completely different. So like we watched them both get married and become mothers and their fathers were these huge influences on them. Like Alice goes against her, Alice's husband is running for one party and her dad's the other. And she's like, again, like starts hating her husband because she's following her dad. And Portia's marriage was just like, I don't, I'm not going to spoil it, Uh, but fill in the blank. I didn't love him. Um, But her dad was such such a positive influence and huge, but like hugely, what is the word I'm looking for? But like so much of her life for both of these women revolved around their dads. And it was just really interesting to see them have this friendship that transcended race and politics and what society thought of it. And it was just so, so good. Um, I had already, like I said before, I've read The American Princess. So I've already read a full biographical fiction about Alice Roosevelt. But, you know, like I read it a few years ago, so you don't remember everything. So this was a nice refresher, but I really enjoyed reading about it in the context of her friendship with Portia. I loved reading about Portia. I would have read a full book about Portia. I'm excited to talk to Piper in 45 minutes and ask her why she decided to like have the two women be together in one book. But it was just really great. Um, A really great historical fiction about the early 1900s. So much politics, just so, so good. Two true American daughters, like the title of the book. Um, I don't want to like go too in depth about their lives because I just don't want to give things away, but really, really enjoyed that. I gave it four stars. Make sure you guys keep an eye out on Thursday. I will be releasing my interview with Piper and I am so excited. Also on that note, I mentioned this on my Instagram. I talked about it on Care What. So, like sometimes I talk about PBG on Care What. Sometimes I do it on the professional book girl account. Like I don't know. To me, it's one and the same, but um, I have a lot of author interviews coming up, which is very exciting. And I asked you guys if you'd like to know about them in advance so you can ask questions and you said yes. So keep an eye out on K Red What and on Professional Book Girl because I'll be putting up question boxes in my stories because I have some great author interviews coming up over the next few months that I am very excited about. The final book is one that I read last week and was obsessed with, and it is The Vatican Princess by C.W. Gortner. I was nervous to read this book, I think because it was a new-to-me author and a new-to-me historical time period. So this takes place in the Italian Renaissance era, and outside of vaguely learning about it in school, my only introduction to that era was when I watched Medici over the summer, which I really loved and highly recommend for my history girlies. Um, It's on Netflix. It was so good. And I learned so much. And after that, I was like, I want to read more books about this time period. But actually... I've owned this book for a few years. This was when, one of my 24 and 24 books. I don't remember how it came into my hands. I think – I know I or, I did it in like a birthday order because like every year for my birthday, I buy myself books on um, bookshop.org, but I don't know how – I got to this book. Like, I know I was like looking for books about Catherine Medici, which is interesting because this was before I even watched Medici. Um, but Catherine Medici, like the French queen, was like very far removed in time from the Medici in the Medici show. But I don't know. Somehow this book ends up in my cart, and I'm so glad that it did. So, like, I, I was gonna say, like, I grew up Catholic, um, because like Vatican, you know. So the Pope big part of this book but it's not like it's not religious literally at all um i was just like i found it interesting because like one thing the catholics do well is the aesthetics and like killed it with this book so this is a biographical fiction biographical fiction about lucrezia borgia i'm probably pronouncing that wrong um i'm not italian 
she was the daughter of a pope. So we meet her as a child. She's like 12 years old. And we learn that her dad, Rodrigo Borgia, he at this time, he's not pope yet. He's just like a very influential figure. Maybe he was a cardinal. I don't really know the um, hierarchy that well of the Vatican. But I should after reading this book, honestly. Um, but he is like – like the girls in American Daughters, her dad is this like looming figure in her life. And we learned that she, her and her three brothers are like bastards. He didn't marry their mom, but he like publicly acknowledges them. And Lucrezia is his favorite child. He makes it very, very obvious. She has two older brothers, Juan and Cesare, who are like huge parts of this book. And then her younger brother, who is kind of just like there. Um, and she is being raised, her and her mom, her mom's kind of a bitch, honestly. And she left her mom's household at some point in the past. And now she's being raised by like an aunt or something like that. And a little bit into the book, her dad not like in like the first 50 pages, her dad is voted Pope, which I know that's what they do from Medici. I should have all those years that my mom made me go to religion after school. That's when I should have known it. But no, it was, um, what is that actor watching Richard Madden and Medici is how I learned it. Um, but anyway, also there's a show about this family called the Borgias, which I will be watching now because I was obsessed with this book, but I watched the trailer for the show before I watched this. And Jeremy Irons plays um, the Pope and Rodrigo Borgia, her dad. I'm just going to call him the Pope from now on. And he was like, you know, they based the Godfather off of this family, which, you know, me coming off of my Sopranos obsession was like immediately intrigued, right? So this is like, he's like the OG Tony Soprano in my eyes. Um, but also there was because the earthquake that I survived today, um, I saw this TikTok of this like guy in New Jersey and it was like caught on the ring camera and he like went outside and he was just like, it was literally as if Tony Soprano was reacting to an earthquake. It, it was just so funny. Anyway, enough about the earthquake. Um, back to Ren the Renaissance period. So I already knew. I was like, once he said it was like the godfather, I was like, all right, I'm I'm in. I'm going to like this book. So her dad becomes Pope and her life really changes. She's moved into apartments in the Vatican and now she is like this huge – she already kind of was a political figure, but now she's a huge political figure because she's the Pope's only daughter. And like the way that the Pope ruled was just so crazy. Like I know we know this from like history and like the Tudors and stuff like that, but he was like acting like a king. Like isn't he just supposed to be God's guy? I don't know. It was just like – so crazy to me. Um, so he, they're like using Lucrezia as a pawn because she can help get like an advantageous marriage. So we follow her as she gets married and it really follows the first half of her life. So much happens. And then I finished and I was like, oh my God. Like, and as I was reading it, I had to, I was like, this is like Game of Thrones, like the shit that's going on in this book. And then I had to keep reminding myself, oh my God, this is fucking history. Like this actually happened. So like, so, so crazy. Truth is stranger than fiction. Um, then I read the author's note and he talked about like the second half of her life. And that could have been like another two full books. Like it was just so insane. So much went on in this girl's life. I really loved her. She starts off very naive and trusting and we see her like toughen up and become so strong as she realizes that her dad and her brothers are just using her. There is, I would say, content warning, there is um, a sexual assault that takes place in this book that is very upsetting to read about and the aftermath is very upsetting. And I don't want to spoil, but the author's note was very interesting because he talked about how he took to, he like kind of pieced together historical rumor with there's a lot of evidence and documents that were left by and about the Borgias and that has how he kind of like came to some of those pivotal scenes in the book but I just really really love this um like I said I love Lucrezia she was so strong and I can't wait to watch the show because the whole time I was watching I was just reading I was like this is insane. Like I need to watch the show. Um, and I feel like maybe I didn't say a lot just now, but I really don't want to spoil anything because it was so, so crazy. I would say like, if you are, if you're someone who's not even in historical fiction and you made it this far in this episode, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you for being here. But the way that this is written, it is like, it's 
crazy. Like this is like a good jumping off point. And now I am so like, I want more Italian Renaissance historical fiction novels. So if you have any recommendations, please send them my way. I enjoyed this so much. This was my first from this author. I own another book by him. Um, His last one, which is about Jenny Jerome, who is Winston Churchill's mother, but he has one about Coco Chanel. So everything in this episode really ties together. Um, He has about Catherine Medici, Isabella of Aragon. So like I am going to be, next time I go to Strand, I'm going to be looking for his backlist because he just broke down like this is new to me history which can be intimidating at times but he I felt like I learned so much and I forgot I was like picking up new information because it's just told in such an interesting and easy to consume and digest way and like I could not stop reading I really really love this I gave it four stars that is the Vatican Princess by C.W. Gortner it is time for some mood reads. Our first request comes from Free Spirit 46 on Instagram, and she's in the mood for a closed room mystery, which is like my least favorite mystery trope, uh, trope, trope. But my favorite one is The Guest List by Lucy Foley. It's like the only Lucy Foley book that I loved. Next, Emily is in the mood for something hopeful that inspires wanderlust. And I would say The Secret Book of Flora Lee, which I covered on possibly the first episode of this podcast, and The Wishing Game by Meg Schaefer. And finally, Goodreads, Grace, and Alive, and Alive I think I'm I typed that wrong. I'm sorry. Um, Is in the mood. I'm obsessed with this for a book that feels like eavesdropping on country club drama. And for that, I recommend The Gifted School by Bruce Holsinger. This is about drama (laughs) involving parents and a school um, and kind of like an upper middle class community. So good. I remember reading it on the beach and just not being able to put it down. That is our show. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure you check out my interview with Piper Hewley on Thursday. Last week, I dropped an episode with Mary Kubica. So check that out. Keep an eye out for upcoming author interviews. Views. Book club is on May 2nd. Our pick is right on cue by Fallon Ballard. Get your thoughts to me by April 30th. Make sure you're following, subscribe to episodes on whatever podcast platform you are listening on. Leave a rating and review, please. Follow me on Instagram at Carrot Follow the show at Professional Book Girl, and I will see you on Thursday.